Hard Rockology Show, Chris and Matt back with you, Gypsy, from the new White Snake album, the Purple album, and on the phone from the band, guitarist Reb Beach. Reb, thanks for joining the Hard Rockology Show. All right, thanks for having me. All right, Reb, I just have to throw this out there. I want to congratulate you. You are now, outside of David Coverdale, the longest member in White Snakes. So, how does that feel? Oh, it's, it's great. Um, I love being in White Snake. Uh, you know, I, I wanted this gig when it first when I first heard about it. Uh, I just sent David everything that I had, and I told him in a letter like, "I am perfect for this gig. <laughs> you know, you need to hire me." Um, and so here it is, thirteen years later, and I, I think I I just keep my gig because I don't make any waves. You know, I just show up and play my part. And that's it. I don't get involved in the drama or any of that stuff. Uh, I just kind of keep, you know, to myself. And um, I, I've always been an easy person to work with, I think. So, you know, it, it, it's all easy going with me. I'm really happy, though. It's You know, David's a, a legend. And especially on, on this record, I really got uh, to feel the, the honor of working with him when he let me sing with him. Um, that song you just heard, that's uh, Gypsy, and I'm doing all the Glenn Hughes parts, so I'm singing, you know, a duet with David Coverdale. So the new album is, is simply called The Purple Album, and it's uh, it's remakes of all the stuff Coverdale did with um, Deep Purple, the Mark III lineup with Richie Blackmore on guitar, Glenn Hughes, like you just said, on vocals and bass, Ian Pace, and obviously John Lord, and then the Mark IV lineup with... Tommy Bowen replacing Richie Blackmore, the other members all the same. What was your first impression when David came up to you and said, hey, the new White Snake album is going to be all remakes of the stuff I did with Deep Purple? What was your first impression on, on that? I was like, killer! <laughs> and I went out and bought all the records, listened to the songs that he chose, and I was thrilled that he picked the best songs of all of them. Um, he just handpicked the coolest songs. Uh, and it was all positive. I was uh, very, very um, excited to to do it. And, and I was kind of hearing it like, okay, we'll make it all 70s and we'll just do two guitars, you know, and have it just be, you know, just kind of underproduced like it was back then. And he was like, absolutely not. That's not what we're doing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, well, what are we doing? Um, he said, I want a giant production of armored tanks coming over the hill to destroy. You know, he said, I want, I want it to be snickified. And he was right. That's exactly what it should have been. And so that's how we approached it. We just approached it as White Snake. Um, and, you know, you got the, the big guitars, the big, you know, it sounds like a, like a record that Steve Vai played on, you know. It's, like, very produced. It, it sounds great. And there's, you know, all nice double wall of guitars and the amazing Tommy Aldridge on drums. Um, and every song is, is great. Well, uh, I'm going to ask you this. You said when he came in there and said, hey, we're going to be doing this, you said you went out and bought those albums. Are you trying to tell me that you hadn't, you didn't have these albums in your collection or maybe were they just misplaced? No, no. I'd never heard any of it. Are um, you serious? I, I, well, no. I had, I had one Deep Purple record that everybody had, the one with Smoke on the Water, Machine Head. Um, and then, you know, and then Kiss. <laughs> then it was Kiss. <laughs> So, <laughs> everybody, everybody's different. Good. Everybody's different. Everybody's got like a favorite band they grew up with. I mean, like you just said, Kiss, and some people grew up with Deep Purple or Van Halen. So, yeah, yeah I was nine years old. You know, I was like nine years old when that stuff was out. So I, I was, you know, listening to the Monkees, like all the hand-me-down records of my brothers and sisters. Well, I mean, when when Coverdale announced that they were going to do this Purple album, one of the things, I mean, I'm just like you, I grew up in the same era you did. I didn't listen to these albums when they first came out, but later on in life, I did pick them up. And one of my biggest problems, let's say with the album Burn, was the production on there. It was a great album, but just the production just didn't seem right. So when Coverdale came out and said that he was going to go ahead and redo these and give them like the uh, 2015 feel to it, I was pretty excited. And having had a chance to listen to some of the tracks, including Burn, I'm really impressed with what you guys were able to do with uh, some material now that's almost 40 years old. Oh, well, thanks. You know, we really, we just played the parts. Um, 
I worked very closely with David. David is a super hands-on guy. He's there every second of every detail of recording and, and making the record. Um, and he's constantly giving his input. And I worked with him arranging, you know, we actually did some different arrangements, like in Burn, the, that whole middle section. I took that home and, and wrote that um, myself. And, and it was kind of, it was kind of hard because I had to kind of stick to the same vibe and the same mode of that song. Anytime I tried to go out and do different chords, it just didn't work, you know. Um, so it just kind of sounds similar, but it's a different section for sure. So we put different sections in just about all the songs, and that was also David's idea to, you know, um, kind of spice up the arrangements. Well, originally, when you go back and you listen to those albums, you had Blackmore on those first two albums, and then Bolin on the, on the third album, and you had John Lord basically, I guess, being the second guitar player, but with the uh, the organ. Now, how did you guys arrange this on the album? Now that there's two guitar players in the band, was that something that you guys traded off with each other, or how exactly did you basically split that up a little bit? Well, you know, there was only one guitar player, and what we did was we just doubled the parts, you know, um, and we added harmonies. Uh, we just did it like White Snake does it, with you know me on the left and the other guy on the right. Uh, just playing the riffs, you know. These are these songs all have guitar riffs, so you just double them up with with each guy, and that's kind of what it sounds like when you've got Tommy Aldridge and you know such great musicians in the band. You know, these are all uh, the, the best of the best hard rock guitar players and drummers and bass players. Was it was it challenging, Reb, to, to, to try to play a Blackmore lead? Because I noticed on like the Stormbringer song, the lead is a lot different and I really enjoy the solo on that song. It kinda it kinda it's it's the thing I like about it is it's not just covering the song like it was in seventy four. It's kinda like like you said a few minutes ago, modernizing it up to twenty fifteen and kinda making it your own song or White Snake's own. Uh, did you find like a lot of the leads like in, in Burn and you said Gypsy and uh, Mistreater to be challenging, and even what about the the ones that uh, Tommy Boland played on? Um, the Tommy Boland thing, <clears throat> I, I always dug Tommy Boland, and uh, I did a thing at the beginning. I don't know if it's even there anymore. And coming home, um, I did like the the kind of the tape echo thing where you speed up the tape, like you play a little note and then he goes yang, 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 yang. you speed it up I did a lot of that uh, I think I did it in the solo too using that um, tape echo and so I, I kind of you know had him in the back of my mind while I was playing over coming home and the same thing with Richie Blackmore you know I played I certain parts that he played uh, I played as well and you kind of have to you know like in burn there's uh, these hooky lines that you got to still make a part of the song, you know, in the solo. So, um, you know, I, I did some of his parts and some of my parts. It's kind of like the same thing when I played in Dokken. You know, I would I would do Lynch solos, but it didn't sound like Lynch, you know. It just sounds like me. Um, and so no matter what I play, I'm not going to sound like Lynch or Blackmore. So I just kind of do my thing in the same general area that they were in. <laughs> you know. Well, having had a chance to see you when you played with Doc, and I think you did a phenomenal job covering the Lynch material, and even the album you played on, Erase the Slate, I thought was, at that time, one of the better Doc and albums in, in recent memory. So, you know what? Right you, you, I appreciate that very much. That's, uh, that's great that you uh, are familiar with that stuff. Thank you. No, I mean, it, I mean, you go back and you listen to it, and I'm glad you said exactly what you said, that, that you're, you're playing these songs, you know, Blackmore... Lynch and all these other guitarists, but yet you're making it your own with your own sound, and I think that in and of itself makes uh, a good guitarist when you're able to take somebody else's material and still put a little bit of yourself in there. So I think you've done that well, and like I said, I've heard most of this album, and I think it sounds phenomenal. Thank you very much. I'm I'm, uh, I'm really happy to have this opportunity uh, to to work so closely with David and to actually, you know, give my input. I co-produced the record. 
uh, and I think you know it's it's it was really cool for me because David really didn't know anything about my talent. Like he just it, we didn't really know each other that well to tell you the truth. I mean, we of course we knew each other, but um, we didn't really hang out. Uh, and so I, when Doug left the band, I flew over to his house and moved in with him to do this record. And so, you know, I, the, some of the parts were kind of messed up, and and you know the keyboard parts I redid all the keyboard parts, and you know redid the bass, and then we got we got together and did the vocals together. And he said, "My God, I had no idea you had you know, such a great voice, and I, I, this blend is amazing." And we did; we blended together as singers really well. Um, and so, and you know, I guess I got to show him my talent, and he. Uh, made me music director and co-producer of the record so that was a great thing for me and um you know i'm just i just love being in white snake and i love working with david we've become really good friends so it's great for me i was going to ask you know let's go into the white snake thing here i mean was there plans to do another studio album with original material and i guess i'll ask two questions here is there a new studio album in the works after this one that you guys are working on? And what was Coverdale's mindset as to why he wanted to do the Purple album now? Is it more of a homage to the uh, Deep Purple fans out there that maybe would probably never get a chance to see these songs played live? I think so. I think it's it's some of that for sure. Um, he was he was talking with the Deep Purple guys about maybe doing some Deep Purple shows or doing a record. And for whatever reason, it just didn't work out. And so he was bummed out about that And because he wanted to redo those, those songs. He, you know, he actually started working on redoing those songs with the Purple guys, you know, with Blackmore. Um, and then it fell through. And he's like, wow, I did all this work for nothing. And then his wife said, why don't you just have the Snake guys do it? And he was like, brilliant! <laughs> <laughs> it's a brilliant idea. And it was a great idea. What's that? It's a brilliant idea. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a great idea. I'm really happy with it. I think the fans are going to totally dig it, because uh, I think, you know, uh, even though you guys know those records, I think a lot of the White Snake fans probably don't. So, it, um, and... Yeah, they're going to be they're going to be pleasantly surprised with the songs. I mean, it sounds like a White Snake record, and there's really good songs on it. And as far as doing an, another studio album, um, I hope so. You know, David and I uh, did a little bit of writing. We didn't really have a lot of time to go somewhere else. You know, we were we were focused on the album. But once in a while, when we were relaxing, he'd pick up the guitar and he'd play me a riff, and I'd say, "Well, why don't you play it? Try it here." And um, we got a feel for what it would be like to write with each other, and I'm a songwriter, and he knows it. Um, he's he's he watched the video of me writing with Kip, so he knows that I know how to write. And uh, I think I think we'd be great together. And Joel is a songwriter too, so um, I, I hope that we will do that. Right now, though, David's focused on doing this. You know, this album just came out, and we're going to tour that for a year, so it's not going to be you know soon <laughs> so, so with with a uh, with a lot of the old purple songs there was obviously Glenn Hughes as the other vocal, vocalist for the band so how did you guys kind of work that out did you sing on a lot of the songs with David or did you guys just have I David the, I, I, I did all the Glenn Hughes parts okay because that was my big question because like I couldn't tell right off the bat with the, the two videos that were out for a while Stormbringer and I'm trying to remember the other one but uh, no, I think it was Burn. Gypsy and You Keep Me Moving are du duets with me and David. So in the verses, it's just me and David. Okay. Because I was kind of, I was always asking my brother, going, well, if Glenn Hughes isn't making any appearances on this record, I wonder if he's going to be making appearances on the tour. And if he isn't, then who's going to be playing his part during the songs? Because as a fan of the Mark III Four lineup, that was a, a big part of, of, of the sound of that band, the two vocalists. Yeah, it's gonna. I've been practicing, and it's not easy uh, singing and playing that stuff at the same time. And it's up there, boy. It's 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 high. Yeah, <laughs> he had a really high voice. And he still does have a really high voice. Um, and you know, I'm no Glenn Hughes, but I sing in tune, and I have a pleasing sound to my vocals. 
Um, so it should work out. And uh, also, we have another great singer in the band, Michele Lupe from Italy. Uh, he's, you know, he's been playing in a White Snake cover band, leading lead vocals in that like his whole life. So he already knew all the songs. <laughs> so, so basically, if Coverdale needs a break, he'll stay. Yeah, in. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have. I'm just sitting here saying this is going to be one of those tours. I think that's really going to take the states by storm this summertime because I mean, like I said it's like you got White Snake playing Deep Purple and it's awesome for me dude because I've been waiting for Coverdale to play these songs forever and, and we didn't get the Purple reunion so this is as best as, it, as it's going to get and I can't wait to see the live live show yeah thanks I you know what me too like me too I can't wait to hear <laughs> I know. it live We're be... I'm dying to hear what that stuff's going to sound like live and that's what you I think that's the first thing someone would think when they listen to this when they listen to this is, you know, wow, I sure would love to hear that live, you know, because the stuff is really rocking and it, it lends itself to arena rock. Um, so, yeah, man, that's, it's going to be big for sure. Well, well, being that David's been talking with the Purple guys, why doesn't he just uh, pick up the phone, call Gillen and Glover and say, hey, you know what, why don't we just do a double headlining? He's not going to call Gillen, dude. He could call Gillen. He gets along fine. He's got to call with... Blackmore. He's, no, I'm just, I'm just sitting there saying, get along, get along with the other guys from Deep Purple, the original lineup, and, and just do a double bill, <laughs> headliner. That way you could get the original Mark. Mark II, we'll have, three. Yeah, we'll have like Blackmore come on stage and, and, and Reb can play like the, the Burn solo with him. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Oh, man. How, I'd be so into that. I'm all for it. Dude, that's what I'm oh. hoping for on this tour. Anything could happen, it seems. I mean, and I am so looking forward to hearing what you guys uh, come up with by playing these songs live. And to me, it's I'm not going to sit there and go, well, it doesn't sound like the album or the way it used to be with Glenn Hughes. I mean, it's it's a different version. It's It's going to be cool and... And just to bring these songs back to life and playing them live, I think, is, is a win-win for everybody. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, that's a good attitude to have about it. Um, you know, yeah, people are, are uh, maybe thinking they, they wanted a, a new studio album, or they, they probably thought we were doing a new studio album, studio album and um, I think they were surprised. But I think when they hear this record, they're going to be pleased, being Whitesnake fans. It just sounds like a great White Snake record to me. If you take away all the purple stuff, did you did you pick his brain about the the time when he joined uh, Deep Purple back in when he was like twenty one, twenty two years old? Did you go, hey David, what was it like being like a unknown singer back in the day, and all of a sudden you're in the biggest band in the world? Did you like pick his brain a little bit about that? I didn't need to. Didn't need to. <laughs> No, I've heard every story there is. That's what I mean. I was like kind of curious. I mean, see, I mean, it, it's like to me, it'd be like, wow. I mean, what was it like? I mean, just coming into the like coming in the white state. But I mean, obviously, you've heard every story. So, I mean, what was yeah, one? He of loved. The- he loved. He loved to talk about the old days, and he's got so many great stories about it. You know, I could just listen to him all day. He's a great storyteller and a very, very funny guy. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's got all kinds of great stories and you know he turned me on to the live deep purple video when they first came to america it's like texas jam or cal jam yeah it's california jam california jam one yeah where richie blackmore takes his guitar and he sticks it head first into a fifty thousand dollar camera um during his solo and just breaks it just glass everywhere and he had to pay for that fifty thousand dollars back then you know but um, David said that during that show, he had a check for a million dollars in his back pocket. <laughs> and I believe, him, you know, David, it's true. And, you know, David's not the kind of guy that uh, embellishes or anything like that. You know, he's a very truthful guy. And so all of his stories, you can bet that that really happened. So he, he's singing at the California Jam, and I, now I'm going to watch that video knowing that he's got a check for a million dollars in his back pocket, singing Burn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So is there anything else you uh, want to ask him, Chris? Uh, just wanted to ask, uh, is, is the, is the, are you guys just going to be focusing on the Purple album, or is it going to be you're going to throw in some other White Snake tunes also? No, you got to play the hits, man. got to play the hits. And, and he's, you know, we all dig the new stuff a lot, and it'd be great to just play the whole damn record but um you know there's only so much time to play a show 
you got to play you got to play both. People want to hear the hits when they come to see a White Snake show. So we're just going to divvy it up uh, and try and just keep the show you know interesting for the whole time. And so what we're going to figure it out at rehearsal on Friday. We're just going to go in and play the songs, play the, all the purple songs and see which ones jump out as the best one. So we're only going to do the best purple songs from the record um, that translate live and then you know, of course, we're going to play Still of the Night, and here I go again, and, and all the ones that everybody knows and loves. Well, I'll ask you this then, okay, with the White Snake catalog, what's the one track that you really enjoy playing, even though you've probably played it hundreds of times now? Is there one track that really stands out that you don't get tired of playing? By far, Still of the Night. That's the song, man. And, like, when Steve Vai joined the band, all, all he ever said was, when are we going to play Still of the Night? Let's play Still of the Night. And like it's, it was all. David said it was almost like he joined the band just to play Still of the Night. <laughs> <laughs> um, that song, you know, I always have a nice little beer buzz by that time. You know, <laughs> it's the end of the show. You know, I know it like it's back of my hand, and you know, you just spread your legs real wide and get ready for that riff. And when he hits that high note with his vocal, it, I just get the hair stand up on my arm every single time. So that's the one. Yeah. There's got to be a Spinal Tap moment, whether you're with Winger or White Snake. But anything with White Snake, a uh, major Spinal Tap moment you've had? Yeah, I mean, we've all had Spinal Tap moments. There, there were more Spinal Tap moments with Winger for sure, because I was just an up and coming young whippersnapper. Um, and you know, by the time I joined White Snake, I was a lot more experienced. But still, a lot of stuff happens. You know. Uh, there was one show where it was our biggest show. It was like Grass Pop Festival in Holland, I think. And uh, David wanted to segue from one song into another. And we get it. We said, all right, David, we're going to do this. And we go out there, and it's so massive. You know, it's just all of our adrenaline was pumping, and, you know, we're all just you know, getting into it and, you know, spotlights and it was just the best show ever. Um, and so it comes time to do the segue and, and to cue the segue, David was going to stand in his David position with, you know, his mic up in the air. <laughs> and so that's what we were all supposed to look for. And none of us were looking at him and all of us forgot about the segue. So, <laughs> so, at the end of the show, you know, we're coming down the stairs, and he's like, "What part of Segway did you not understand?" <laughs> we, you know, you mess stuff up up there. You know, one time we had a train wreck where we just had to stop the song. Stop! Stop the song! <laughs> Sorry, David. I, I don't know. I mean, that, that's live, though. That's what's fun about going to see a live show. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. We don't play to tape, and, you know. We don't play to a tracks or anything like that. And some people thought that we had, you know, background tracks on tape, and no, we just, you know, we've always done it ourselves. Well, Rob, I have to say, after hearing your impression of David Coverdale, yeah, that's awesome. It is awesome, <laughs> but I don't think I'll ever be able to see Coverdale again without thinking exactly of Cap- without thinking of Captain Picard from Star Trek. That's exactly what he sounds <laughs> like now. <laughs> He's, he's got a great voice. He really does. All right, man. So looking forward Thanks. to uh, looking forward to seeing you guys on the road and uh, hopefully catching up with you uh, when you come out to L.A. So so like we do with all of our guests, why don't you go ahead, Reb, and, and introduce another track? Okay. Um, well, uh, my favorite song on the record is Mistreated, which was the big uh, Richie Blackmore solo song. I went out and bought a Strat just so I could, uh, you know, sound a little bit more authentic. Um, and it's a blues song, and it's not my favorite because I played the guitar on it. It's my favorite just because it's got the vibe. Uh, it's got a real, a real vibe of a band. There's lots of air in it, and you can really hear David's vocal and uh, what a great legendary singer he truly is. <laughs> 